Standing, please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. We're doing a series through 1 Thessalonians. And uh, last week we looked at the introduction to the book. And uh, today we're going to get into the meat of the message in chapter 1. In chapter 1, uh, we learn about how this church had the right stuff. And so we'll start at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. You say, why in chapter 3 if we are studying in chapter 1? Because this is kind of introductory to the message to give you an idea, a little bit of an idea of what the church was doing and what they were facing. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, let's read verses 1 through 6. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to read along with me. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we have some extras under the chairs for you to use while you're here. And then next week when you come, bring a Bible. Right? Amen? Amen. All right. 1 Thessalonians, starting in chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we were appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I said to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now, when Timotheus came from you to us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Let's pray. Lord, your word is always good. It doesn't matter where we read, where we study, where I preach. It's always good. But this is what you have ordained for today. This is what you've given us for this moment. Help us to be attentive to your word. Help us to be attentive to the voice of your spirit speaking to our hearts. And that, Lord, your will would be done in our lives. That our church would shine. That we would be the kind of church we need to be. And, Lord, if there's anyone here in our midst that's not saved, dear God, I pray you'd save them today. And if there's any Christian here that's struggling, Lord, in their life with sin, not walking as close to you as they need to, not walking in the light, I pray, dear God, you break their hearts and help them, Father, see their need. The, the lack of joy in their life is there because they're not following you. And so, Lord, help us today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, Paul had some current concerns about the church in Thessalonica. How they were going to be able to stand. If you remember from last week, he got ran out of town by a, a certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. And so... He ends up traveling, and now he is writing a letter, and uh, most people believe that he was in Corinth when he wrote the letter. And he knew that there was a lot of persecution there in the city against the believers that there. And so he sends Timothy to go there and check on them to find out how they're doing. Because he was only allowed to stay there for about three to four weeks, and that's surely not enough time to teach a whole lot of good doctrine so he's a bit concerned about whether or not they are able to stand and what they're doing. And so he sends Timothy. Timothy goes and he finds out the situation and he returns home and he says, Paul, these guys are doing awesome. You would not believe how great they're doing. And so he comes back and shares the news. And yeah, there's a lot of persecution. Yes, there's a lot of problems there. But uh, they're doing great. So Paul's letter... When he writes, he writes the letter to a group of young believers who maybe don't know everything that they, that, that they should know. How many of y'all can identify with that? Amen? Don't know everything that we should know, right? That's most of us. So he writes to them to explain some very important truths and also to encourage them, to tell them that we as believers have a hope. We have a hope. The Lord is coming. He is going to take us away from all of this someday. So he's trying to lift their spirits. So when, when Timothy comes back, Paul discovers that they're very much alive. And not only are they doing well, but they're having an impact. They're reaching out 
to other parts of the world. And we'll find that out as we get more into the message. And that's exactly what every church ought to be doing. I love it when we get together. Amen. I love when we sing and we, we testify and we fellowship and we study the Word of God and the friendships here. They're, everything about our church is so encouraging, such a blessing to so many of us. But if all we do is stay within these walls, we've missed a big part of our mission. There's a world out there that needs Jesus. And we've got to tell them. This church didn't know a lot. But they were on the job. They were doing what they should have been doing. So, um, and I made the statement last week, and you might remember this, but whether you want to or not, believer, you're going to make an impact. Remember that? You're either going to make a positive impact or you're going to make a negative impact, but you're going to make an impact. You will have an influence one way or another. So now as we look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I want you to turn back there, I want you to notice some things that this church had. They had the right stuff. They really did. And if you've got your bulletin, you can see that there's a good five-point outline there for you. They've got the right pattern. We'll look at that in the first four verses. Then the right path. We'll see that in verses 5 and 6. The right promotion, verses 7 and 8. The right priority in verse 9. And then finally, the right patience in verse 10. So with that being said, let's go ahead and look at verses 1 through 4. The right pattern. Notice how Paul begins the epistle. He says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. Wow, what a great start. I want you to focus on verse 3 for a moment. I want you to notice what verse 3 says. Paul writes and he says, remembering without ceasing. I always like that word, you know, the word without, well, that's two words actually, without ceasing. I always like that. Your, what does he remember? He remembers their work of faith. He remembers their labor of love. He remembers their patience, their patience of hope. Three things mentioned there in this verse. Faith, hope, and love. That's the pattern of their life. Faith, hope, and love. Their pattern was not, i got to go to church because it's Sunday morning and the pastor's going to be looking for me. That was not their pattern. Their pattern was not, I need to dress a certain way in order to please certain people. That wasn't their pattern. Their pattern was not, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to get involved in all the church ministries and I'm going to labor and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that so that people will think kindly of me. That was not their pattern. Now all of those things happen, no doubt. And all of those things need to happen, no doubt. But let's not get things out of order. The inside is more important than the outside. The inside is right, the outside will be right. The outside can look right, the inside be wrong all day long. So we've got to make sure that we get the order right. Their pattern was faith, hope, and love. These triplets in the scripture seen in the New Testament in numerous places. Not only do we see it here in chapter 1, but if you turn over to chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I want you to notice in verse 8. The same three things are mentioned there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. If you have your Bibles, please follow along with me. I like that. Don't just sit there and stare at me. I'll call on you to read. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Faith, hope, and love. You find the same thing mentioned in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. Very famous passage. It's in the love chapter. You get down toward the end of the love chapter in verse 13. It says, And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, which by the way is love. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Faith, hope, and love. These three things mentioned together again in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. Now turn to Galatians chapter 5. 
Galatians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Notice how it's expressed there. Galatians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. There it is again. Faith, hope, and love. By the way, these things are internal things. They're not external things. All that you see on the outside are in the, is an expression of this pattern that's going on on the inside. This faith that we have in the Lord and what He's done for us. Our hope that He's going to come again. And our love, not only for God, but also for others. All of that starts in the inside. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Verses 4 and 5. Colossians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Again, Paul writes there and he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel? Faith, hope, and love. That is the Christian pattern. That's what you're supposed to be working on in your life. The other things that we read about, you know, about going to church or doing this or doing that, those things are expressions of what's going on inside. Now, when Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, he mentions our work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope, it, it seems to me that Paul had these three things in mind as he writes the rest of the book. And as I read through the book, and I hope you will, take some time Read through this book. We're going to be here for several weeks, probably about eight or nine weeks. So read through 1 Thessalonians every week. It'll be good for you, okay? It's five chapters or not that long. Uh, just do that every week, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But it seems like the first part of the book, the first couple of chapters, chapters 2 and 3, seems to deal very heavily with the matter of their faith. Their faith. The matter of their salvation. And then it, it seems to me, you know, what, what, what he's saying there is that their faith was growing. Their faith was changing their life. That which is outside coming from the inside. You know what we say today? Yeah, oh, okay, you can be saved. You can have your faith. But don't go overboard with this. Don't get too fanatical. You can have your faith. Keep it on Sunday mornings. Keep God in a box. But don't let it affect the rest of your life. And certainly do not let it affect us. We don't want to know about your faith. You can tell us you have it, but stop there. That's what the world will tell us, but that's not what they were doing. Then I notice as we move through the book and we get into chapter 4, especially the first 12 verses or so, Paul seems to deal with their love, their, their love for God, their desire to please God. This is especially clear in the very first verse of chapter 4. We'll read that later. But it was very clear that they wanted to please God in their life. By their godly living. They loved one another. They served one another. And they reached out to the lost. What do we do today? You know, I read something this morning. I don't know where I read it or where it was written. Don't ask. But uh, this preacher said that he knew that the Bible must be inspired. And he said, uh, it, 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 this is not correct, but this is what he said. He said it was written by the 12 apostles. Now, you know that there's probably 30-some people uh, in the writing of the Bible, and some of them weren't even apostles, okay? But nevertheless, he said this. He said, you can't get 12 guys to agree on anything. He said, you just can't do it. These 12 guys, they all died for the truth. Nowadays, you can't get 12 people together, and he used Watergate. If you remember Watergate, there were 12 people involved in that. He said, those 12 guys couldn't keep one lie for four weeks. <laughs> But the 12 apostles kept the truth for 40 years. All right? So that's what he said. I thought that was pretty interesting. That's what we do today. We can't even get along about anything today. It's really bad. You, any church you have, if you've got three people in church, you've got a church split. Right? That's just kind of the way it looks sometimes. Uh, thankfully, uh, we, we have the Lord, and the Lord can help us do things like that. But anyway, the third part of the epistle, chapter 4, verse 13, and going on through chapter 5, verse 11, he deals a lot with their hope, their expectation of Christ's return. They were patient in tribulation. Why? Because they had hope. Patience and hope. Remember that? Chapter 1, 
in verse 3. Today, you see Christians quitting everywhere. They'll be at church one Sunday and you don't see them for a month. And then you catch them out in the, you know, in the supermarket or, you know, in the BX or the, the post office. Or you say to them, you say, hey, brother, where you been? We missing you. And he says, I've just been going through some things alone without the brethren to encourage you. Turning your back on God. You've lost your hope. You've forgotten that all that there is in this life is not all there is in life. Never forget that. This life is nothing. It's a vapor. It's going to come and it's going to go. It's going to be over faster than you can imagine. And your life will be about that much on the line of eternity. So don't focus on this life. Focus on that hope. These three inner graces. We see the perspective of the whole Christian life. Our faith as an expression of, of what we believe that happened in the past at Calvary. My faith in Christ. My walk with Him because of what He's done for me. And then, not just my faith, but my hope. My hope of the future, of what's coming for me. This is not all there is to it. Thank the Lord. Now listen, I don't have it bad. I'll be the first one to tell you. I don't have it bad. I, I, li you know, I live in a comfortable city. I have a great church of people that I, I hope love me. You, you love me, right? Amen. You have to. The Bible says love your enemies, right? So you have to love me. Um, I'm surrounded by people that love me. Uh, you know, I've got a great wife. I've got some wonderful kids and the best grandkids in the world. If you've got grandkids, you can say that about your own if you like. But mine are truly the best in the world. Okay? I'll just say that right up front. And uh, I, I, I'm perfectly happy with all of that. But that's not all there is to life. That's not all there is to life. Right? I get to drive the church van. I'm happy with that. Live in the church parsonage. That's great. But this life is not all there is to life. So never focus all your attention on this life because this life is not life. What we've got coming is far greater than that. Far better than anything we could ever experience down here. In a moment's time, North Korea could be on us and we could all lose everything this earth has to offer us. But you can never lose your hope. They can't take that. Your hope of heaven, that's secure. They can't take that. And then our love, our, our, our expression toward the lost and toward, and toward our brothers and toward the Lord. Our love. So these three things, that's the pattern. Do you have the right stuff? Let's look at these. Let's break them down a little bit. Let's talk about each one. The work of faith. The work of faith. What is it? Well, faith. The work of faith is, first of all, salvation of the soul. That's where it begins. You cannot be saved by the work of the flesh. That happened that way. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 tell us that. You're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a work. It's this, this what we have. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You place your faith in Christ and you're saved. But secondly, faith motivates us. Not just to be saved, but to act in righteousness. Which is evidence of true biblical faith. Look at Ephesians 2.10. If you're still there, I hope you are. I hope you turn there. Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Your faith does not just save you, but it, 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 it propels you to do works of righteousness. James chapter 2, verse 18. I love the way James writes this. He says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith. And I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. You see, biblical faith saves you at the cross. But it also propels you to do works of righteousness. He also mentions the labor of love. Labor of love? What's that? Labor of love. Some people think labor of love is when somebody that you love asks you to do something wacky and crazy. And you do it for them anyway. Even though you want, don't, don't want to. Well, that might be a labor of love, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. Here it's a little bit different. The, the reason, the motive behind all that you do is your love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says, We love Him because He first loved us. Why did He do what He did? Why did God do what He did? Because He loves me. The motivation is love. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. 
Jesus said unto them, unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love for God and love for man. Love for God and love for man. That's what we're supposed to have. That's the right stuff. And then our patience. Patience of hope. Looking again at 1 Thessalonians 1.3, this is the third thing mentioned. The patience of hope. You know what the word patience implies? The word patience implies that you're going through something that you don't enjoy or don't like and don't want. You don't patiently eat ice cream. At least I don't. I ate it with patience. Yeah, okay. No. Patience implies that you're going through something you don't enjoy. Folks, this life is a challenge. Every day. You cannot escape that. If you're living the life you're supposed to, the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's going to come if you're living right. And you need patience. And it's not, we don't have that kind of hope. It's not the kind of hope where we go, Man, I hope I go to heaven. It's not that. That's not the use of the word hope here. This is a sure thing. It's a steadfast promise. A sure hope. Something we know. And because we have this hope, we can look to it with patience in our life. We can face affliction. We can deal with conflict. We can undergo pain and heartache and sickness and even death. But we don't face it without a sure hope of something better coming. The church of Thessalonica had this. They were in affliction. Notice what it says in verse 6. They had their affliction. But rather than be discouraged, they were only pushed on. They were egged on with a deep resolve to be faithful and to be loving and to put their, put their hope in the Lord Jesus' return. That's what they had as a church. And that's what made them the church that they were. They had the right stuff. So Paul and the church shows us a pattern. And now you have to ask yourself the question. Do you have the right stuff? I'm not asking you if you carry the right Bible translation. You know how I feel about that, but that's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking you if you listen to the right music or if you wear the right kind of clothing. And all those things are important in the right place. But what's going on inside of you? Is there faith, hope, and love? Because that's the right pattern. That's where real <laughs> biblical Christianity starts. And everything else grows out from that. The Bible teaches us what the right stuff is. And I, you know, I don't want you, if you look at verse 4, it mentions 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, Knowing, brother, beloved, your election of God. And I don't want us to get too distracted uh, with the whole doctrine of election. We could be here for weeks talking about that. What I do want you to notice is the overlying thought, okay? The overlying thought. The Bible teaches that we are elected according to God's foreknowledge. It's that simple. We don't have to understand it. All we have to know is it's in the Bible and we believe it. It's that easy. But the fact is, these people were God's people. And that was obvious to Paul. That was extremely obvious. He didn't suspect. Hmm. I wonder if that guy's a Christian. Because he bowed his head and prayed over his people. He didn't have to wonder if they were God's people. He knew they were God's people. He said, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election. He didn't say suspecting. Can I ask you a question in your life and the people you work with? Do they suspect you're a Christian? Or do they know it? Because you're supposed to know it. They're supposed to know for a fact that you are a child of God, not only from the things that you say, but also from the way that you live. Paul says, I know about you. I know you are God's people. So these people had the right pattern in their lives. But I also want you to notice, number two, that they were on the right path. Notice this in verses 5 and 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. He says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, 
having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Followers of Paul, but most importantly, and of the Lord. Did you notice that? They were following Paul, and that's good because Paul said, follow me as I follow, as I follow Jesus. He says that in a couple of places. We're supposed to follow the Lord, ultimately. Paul led them down the right path. He led them down the path and they wholeheartedly followed that path. They followed his message. And that's what it means there. When it says they followed him, it doesn't mean that when Paul got up and decided to walk into the living room that they all went to the living room. Then when he got up and decided to walk into the bedroom that they all went to the bedroom. It doesn't mean when Paul decided to go to the restaurant that they all went to the restaurant. That's not what following means. It means that when Paul taught them something, they got with the program. They knew it. They said, this is what the Bible says and I'm going to do it. Listen, folks, this is something that every Christian struggles with from time to time. But some Christians struggle with a lot. You know what the Bible says about what you're saying or what you're doing. Get it right and get with the program. You become a better person by it. They followed him. Paul's preaching, he says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. This was Paul's message. This was his preaching. He preached with authority because he did not speak alone. He preached with the power of the Spirit of God. And I believe if we would do the same thing in our life, in our witnessing, and in our preaching, we would see results too. We make sure that we're speaking with the authority of God's Word and the power of the Spirit of God. Something's going to happen. There will be results. And I remind you that most of the people that heard Paul hated him. Most of the people that hear you, they're not going to like you either. But there will be that few that respond. There will be that few that wants to hear the gospel, that wants to listen to what you have to say because the Holy Spirit of God is moving in their hearts. And I want you to notice there's a direct correlation here between the man, Paul, and his message and his method that he used among them. Notice in chapter 2, verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. So Paul wrote them and he said, you know what, what I was like. You know how I lived. You know what I did among you. The result of all of this was that the people received the message, and how did they receive it? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also among you that believe. He said, you, when you heard my preaching, you knew that that message was from God. And i got to tell you, every preacher wants that. You know what I'm saying? I want that. I want you to know that this sermon did not come from the internet. This sermon did not come from a book. You can go to Christian bookstores and you can find, find a book. Preachers can go get a book from the bookstore that says, uh, you know, there's a sermon in there for every uh, service in your church, you know, for, for Wednesday night and Sunday morning and Sunday night. And they'll even have the dates. They'll say, sermons for 1995 or sermons for 2018. You can find it like that. And there are pastors that use those books. I'm not one of those. I'm not one of those. I get into the Bible until I think I know what it is the Lord wants me to say. And then I pray about it and I work on it and I work on it and I pray about it and I pray about it and I work on it until I think it's exactly what I think the Lord wants. And then I deliver it. And after that, I'm always praying. I'm saying, Lord, please let our church receive this message from you. You may have noticed that when I prayed this morning and just about every Sunday morning when I pray, I say, Lord, help us to open our hearts and we'll, we'll hear your voice. Every preacher wants to preach to a people who are listening for the voice of God. So when you came in this morning, what were you listening for? If you're looking for good music, I'm sorry, we probably let you down. If you were looking for great personalities, well, some of you all let the rest of us down. If you were looking for handsome people, you came to the wrong church. But if you are looking to hear the voice of God, God will speak to you. Through His Word, He'll speak to you. 
So what did you come here to hear? I want you to notice in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. Our message must be the word of God. This is what God has for us. This is what God's method is. This is what God has ordained. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Paul writes and says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I read somewhere that, you know, some Bible commentator thought that Paul had performed some kind of miracles, had done some miracles in Thessalonica, and that's why he spoke of the word coming with power. But if you go back to Acts chapter 17, which records what he did while he was there, you will find that there's not one miracle in that chapter. Not one. I'm not saying that he didn't do something. But what I am saying is that I don't think that's what Paul's message was about. I think what he was trying to emphasize is the fact that the Word of God is powerful. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says this, The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder between soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows, and get this, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why when you read the Bible, you feel bad sometimes. Because God's revealing some things about you. He's poking you. And saying, you got a problem right here. That's the power of the Word of God. The end of verse 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, tells us that they were filled, they were left with much assurance. The gospel produces assurance. I received a phone call yesterday morning from a brother that was here in the past, and he, he was struggling. He says, you know, I'm just struggling. I, 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 I'm worried about, you know, I, I, I'm struggling... And I'm not sure about my salvation. I know I'm saved, but then I have these doubts. Why am I having these doubts? I said, um, you're having those doubts because of sin. I don't know what the sin is, but that's why believers have doubts. I've never seen a guy who's living for God have doubts. A guy that's walking in the light doesn't have doubts. It's only after he steps out of the light and does something dumb. Now he's going, oh man, how can I be a Christian? Because look what I've done. Listen, the truth of God produces full assurance. Hang on to that. Because you're going to need it. It's going to become important to you in the future. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know you're saved. And you know if you're not. Deep down inside, you know whether you're saved or you're not. If the Holy Spirit indwells you, He is witnessing with your spirit that you are a child of God. That's what the Bible says. So if you're struggling with doubt, it's probably because you're just feeling really rotten and you want to beat yourself up a little bit. There are some people like that. They followed Paul down the right path. A path of power, a path of assurance, and as Paul clearly states, a path that was led by the Holy Spirit Himself. Remember how Paul got there. Remember how Paul got there. He wanted to preach here, and the Holy Spirit said, Nope, not here, Paul, keep on moving. He wanted to preach there, and the Holy Spirit says, No, I'm not there, Paul, keep on moving. He finally ends up in this place, and, and he, has a, he has a vision, and he sees a man saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So he goes over to Macedonia, where he comes to Thessalonica. Spirit-led. Our path is spirit-led. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Notice that word. Love, joy. Is it that? <coughs> love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. It's a great list. The path that is led of the Holy Spirit is the path full of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness. All of those things are available in the Christian life if you'll stay on the path. You know what happens if you go walking out the woods? And I, you know, I'm, I know a little bit about the woods in Virginia. You don't walk off the path. Not unless you've got a very big shotgun, maybe some bear spray, some boots, you know. They say that rattlesnakes, you know, usually when rattlesnakes bite, it's usually below the knee. So I walk on my hands. <laughs> anyway, um, you, you don't get off the path because it's dangerous. Christian, don't get off the path. It's dangerous. 
follow the leading of the Spirit. So they had the right pattern, they were on the right path, and now they were experiencing the right promotion. And I love this. Get this thought now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith that God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Now look, there are certain churches in the New Testament that stand out, and they stand out because of their prominence in church history. Like Jerusalem, that's where it all started. You can't think of the New Testament churches without thinking of Jerusalem. Antioch, you'll find out in Acts chapter 13, that this church becomes the center of missionary activity, reaching out to the Gentile world. You don't typically think of the church in Thessalonica. If someone were to say to you, list the prominent churches in the New Testament, most people would not list this church. And I think it's unfortunate because of what it says about this church. Notice what is said about this church. They became examples to the believers of Macedonia and Achaia. Macedonia is not a small place. It's a big area. They were examples. This young group of believers on fire for God, not even knowing everything that they probably should have known at this point, they became examples. You don't have to be a 35, you don't have to be saved 35 years to be an example. You can be an example as a very young Christian. You might not know everything, but you're doing what you know. And people see that. And you become an example. These folks were an example in Macedonia and Achaia. You might not be aware of this, but Macedonia had 50 different cities and towns in it. It was a big area with a whole lot of people in Paul's day. Achaia, which is, is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, you became examples of Macedonia and Achaia. Achaia is kind of important because Achaia, Achaia is where we find the, the church of Corinth, where Paul wrote the letter. So he could hear firsthand about these believers in Thessalonica. They were examples in Macedonia and Achaia. So how did they become such a prominent congregation? What was it that gave them what they, they had as far as the testimony is concerned? Look again at verse 8, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. He says, uh, Every place your faith to God word is spread abroad. You sounded out the word of the Lord, and all of these places, your faith to God word is spread abroad. So that's the thing that got them promoted, if you will. They got with the program. They were sharing the gospel. They were spreading God's word. These guys were not sitting around on a mountaintop going, Jesus is coming again. You heard about that, right? It's happened so many times. Like, you know, all these different stories. You know, some guy will say, Jesus is coming. He's coming on June the 3rd in 2019. So let's all sell our land and our houses and our cars and and, uh, you know, let's, let's sell it all and give the money to the church and let's all go sit on a mountaintop with white robes on and wait for the rapture. <laughs> Folks, listen. This has happened so many times in history. Don't go for that. Jesus said we're never, never going to know the day or the hour. Don't listen to those people. They're charlatans. And if they're not charlatans, they're at least biblically ignorant. I'll at least give them that much wiggle room. All right? But these people aren't doing that. They were getting with the program. They were out sharing the Word of God. And, and here's the thing. We know that life gets hard sometimes, and sometimes we don't want to speak, but, but don't get discouraged. You just push through it and you do it, because that's what's going to make your testimony shine. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good courage. I've overcome the world. This is what Jesus told them. He said, you're going to have some persecution in the world. There's going to be some problems in the world, but don't worry about that. I've overcome the world. We've got that part handled. We've got it taken care of. And they noticed that they didn't just keep the message in their church. Their, their, their faith was everywhere. People could see their faith. <clears throat> kind of reminded of what Paul said to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. He says, preach the word be instant, 
How many of y'all like instant food? You like instant food? Yeah, I, I like instant ramen. It's not good for me. I know it, but I like it. But one of the things that makes instant food so attractive is that it is instant. You don't have to wait long. You get hungry, so you get instant food. It's immediately gratifying, right? Now, I know when it comes to food, instant food's bad for you. But folks, when Paul says be instant in season and out of season, he's not saying that you wait around and pray about it for a while. He's saying get with it. You know, here's what a lot of Christians do. My brother is lost. Can you pray with me for my lost brother? Good start. The very next week. My brother is lost. Will you pray, pray for my brother? The next week. My brother is lost. Will you pray for my brother? Well, have, you, have you spoke with him? No, no, I'm just praying about it. Look, if, if you don't do something, they're not going to get the message. It's sad that God is going to have to move some of us out of the way and put other Christians in there to do the job because we won't. It's sad that God has to work that way sometimes. But He does. Be instant. In season. In other words, when it's probable. When you feel like it. Out of season. In other words, when you don't feel like it. When it's not probable. When it's not convenient. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort with all those offering. And we don't mind that whole exhorting part, you know. But when, whenever we have to reprove or rebuke, we don't like to do that. <coughs> but it's important. And God's Word says that that's how we're supposed to be getting the Word out. 2 Timothy, preach the Word. What is one thing that makes a church great? It's evangelistic outreach. Now, that's not the only thing. There are other things. But this is one thing that makes a church great. It certainly is a big deal to God. We need to get the word out. The rest of the world will never see our faith if we don't show them. How many of y'all have been to Lote Mart in the last week? Come on, raise my pie. I want to see the guilty parties. How many of you have been to Lote Mart in the last month? How many of you just don't go to Lote Mart? You'd rather go to E-Mart. Okay. Can I ask you a question? When you went to Lote Mart, you went in there, you did your shopping, and you bought your food, and you went out, and I'm not condemning this because this is what we do. That's what we do in supermarkets. We go shopping, we buy food, we come out. You went in there, you did your shopping, you bought your food, and you came out. Did anybody look at you down the aisle and say, I just got a feeling from the way he's picking out that watermelon that he's a child of God. Amen. That doesn't happen. Okay? It doesn't happen. If you don't tell them, they don't know. You've got to tell them. Some people say, well, I'm just going to live a good life and everybody's going to see what a good guy I am. They're going to wonder why and they're going to ask. No, they're not. You know what they do to good guys? They want to corrupt them. They want to drag them down. They'll go to you and they'll say, I see that you're a good guy. You're pretty naive. You must have grown up on a farm or something. Come on, let me show you how to live. Now look, I know that's true because I used to be one of those guys. And the Lord saved me, thankfully. But He didn't save me because I looked at somebody who was living right and said, I wonder what he's got. I wonder what kind of life he has. Can I ask you what it is about you that makes you live so good? No. I hated that guy. If he had not shared the Word of God with me, I'd still be lost today, all things considered, humanly speaking. And I'd still hate him. Because that's what lost people do. Folks, listen. Don't go for that lie. If you don't tell them the Word of God, they're never going to hear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I also preached unto you, which ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Notice verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that the same message that I got, I'm giving to you. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the Gospel. That's what you're supposed to be telling them, according to the Scriptures. What you don't tell them is, hey, God loves you and He has a plan for your life. That's true, but that's certainly not enough. Alright? What you need to tell them is, 
God loves you and He has a plan for your life, but you're messing it up because you're a sinner. And if you die without Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And they're not going to like the message. But you've got to tell them anyway because that's the only hope they have. What made this church great was that their faith to God word was spread abroad, but so was their preaching. They had the right pattern. They were on the right path with the right promotion. And then I want you to notice the next thing, the right priority, verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. I think it's one of the best illustrations of repentance in the whole Bible. You see, repentance involves turning away from darkness and turning to the light. Every person who has ever truly been born again has sought to follow their confession with a turning from sin. Every true believer wants to live a right life. Will you make mistakes? Sure you will. But you want to live a right life. That's what repentance is all about. We don't become perfect. There's still a lot about ourselves that we do not know. That God is going to change. That He's going to reveal. But what God has shown us, those are the things He expects us to obey. Notice this in Acts 26 and verse 20. Paul writes and he says, But show first unto them of Damascus, this is what he did, and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, what did he show them? That they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. And don't tell me you're a Christian and you say, you know, you go knock on the door and say, I'm Jim Taylor and I'm from Haven Baptist Church and I'd like to share Christ with you. Oh, that's okay, I'm already saved. I've been saved for 20 years. Oh, really? Where do you go to church? No, I don't go. I, you know, I haven't been living right. For 20 years? Don't give me that. I'm not believing it. You say, well, pastor, that's not very spiritual. He could have been out of the will of God for 20 years. I don't care. You can say that if you want. I suppose it's possible, but I have a hard time believing he got what I got. Because what I got doesn't allow me to sleep at night if I'm not living for God. What I got makes me restless if I'm not living for God. What I got, I can't go a week out of the will of God without wanting to pray and say, Lord, I'm sorry. What I got... It's not what he's describing. And if, if he says it's going quack, quack, and I'm, and I'm saying it's going, you know, gobble, gobble, then obviously he didn't get the same thing I got. You all understand what I'm saying here? Don't go for that lie. When they tell you, well, I've been sick for 30 years, I just haven't been living right. My first, my, my first impulse is to look at him and say, he's such a liar. Now I don't do that. Instead I say, you know what, what you need, you need to repent of your sins. And you need to get your life back with, with the Lord. And I know because if they'll repent of their sins, it won't matter. You know, we'll just take care of it there. But, you know, that's a lie. Because true salvation goes somewhere. It turns from darkness and it turns to light. You turn from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what they were doing. Christ changes lives. When we come to know Christ, we want to abandon our false life, our false idols. We want to ab abandon our love for, for materialism and, and our desires, uh, selfish motives. We want to abandon all that. And we still struggle because we still got the flesh. But that's what we want. Somebody said it this way, God changes, God changes our want-tos. 2 Corinthians 5.17. And I want you to notice this, this verse. Read it very carefully. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Every child of God should have this verse in their minds, in their hearts. Because this is what you are as a child of God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You are not becoming a new creature. You are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You are a new creature, and now everything else in your life is changing. You're not the same old guy you used to be. When I got saved, I knew about four sins. I had four sins in my life the day I got saved. Four. There was drinking, there was cussing, there was hanging out with bad people, and there were girls. And I knew that those four things had to go when I got saved. And I got saved, and those four things went. And then the very next week, God showed me a fifth thing. I was like, whoa, there's more of this Christian life than what meets the eye. 
So I had to get the fifth thing right. And then there was the sixth thing, the seventh thing. And now I'm probably up to about 74,452 things. Who knows? But God is constantly showing us new things that we didn't know. And when he does, we change. The right pattern, the right path, the right promotion, the right priorities, and then finally the right patience. Notice this in verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. I hate waiting. Waiting requires patience. And I don't want to be patient. I don't like to be patient. I want what I want, and I want it now. That's the way we are. But when it comes to the coming of Christ, we need to learn to wait. The kind of waiting we're talking about here is a little bit different. We're talking about a hope that we have in Christ's return. We aren't just waiting around like a person waiting on a bus or waiting in the line at, at, the, at the bank. We are, we are busy while we're waiting. We are serving with an expectation while we're waiting. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he had hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You say, if you had it now, then you don't have a hope. Right? But now we do have a hope, and we're waiting. We know that we live in a wicked world. No doubt about that. And we know that there's something even worse coming. Reading the book of Revelation, we won't take time to read all of this, but you can read in Revelation. The book of Revelation has some pretty bad stuff coming. Bad stuff coming. The wrath of God coming. Now some folks think that when Paul mentions, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 1.10, that, that when Paul mentions the wrath of God, that he's talking about hell. They believe that hell is God's wrath and that we will be delivered from it. Well, that's true, but I don't think that's what that really means. Because, folks, God's wrath already abides on the believer. Remember that? We talked about that a few weeks ago. In John 3.36, the wrath of God abideth on him. So, the wrath of God is not coming. The wrath of God is here, spiritually speaking. Paul is not talking about hell. He's talking about the tribulation when God's wrath, Satan's wrath, and man's wrath will all be poured out upon the earth at the same time. It's going to be bad. Really bad. But we're not going to go through that. We're not going to experience that because we're waiting for the Son of God who has already delivered us from the wrath to come. Titus 2.13. It's one of my... I love this verse. It's a wonderful verse. It says this, Looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. You see, I am not looking for things to get bad. I am not looking for all the wrath that's going to happen in the tribulation. You know, the wrath of man and the wrath of God and the wrath of the, of the devil. I'm not looking for that. It's going to come, but I'm not looking for that because I'm looking for the rapture. You see? I'm looking for that blessed hope, not looking for that bad day that's going to come. You see the difference here? That blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And because we are looking for Christ, there are some results in our life. One result is that we're busy. Are you busy? Well, I'm waiting for Jesus to come again. That's great. Luke 19, verses 12 and 13. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went on a far journey to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. That word occupy doesn't mean to sit around and do nothing. It means to be busy doing something. To occupy till I come. We are to be busy. Are you busy? Are you, are you a Sunday morning only Christian and the only time you live for God is on Sunday morning? Oh, Sunday morning. Let's take God out of his box and go play with him. Put him back in and We'll live the rest of our week out without God. If, if that's you, you're not busy, and you're not taking His coming very seriously. The second thing I know is when you, when you know that Jesus is coming again, you're going to do what you can to clean up your life. You're going to try to live a clean life. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, it says this, And every man that hath 
this hope in him purified himself, even as he is pure. When was the last time you took a look at your life and evaluated what you do, where you go, the things you say, the things you don't say? Evaluated the things of your life to see if there's anything there that's not as pure as it ought to be. Because you see, according to this verse, every man that had this hope in him purified himself. So what are you doing? You should be checking it out. Looking at your life to see what you can clean up next. You do that when you do spring cleaning in your house, right? You get everything clean, your neighbor would think your house is clean, but you're looking for what you can clean next. Now here's the conclusion. God saved us and He put us on the right path. He's given us a good leader to be led by the Spirit of God. He's not going to put us on the path. We are already on it. As such, we aren't trying to figure out how to get to heaven. If you read the book of Philippians, you are already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm not trying to get there. I am there, spiritually speaking. In heavenly places with Christ. So all of that is taken care of. Because of all of this, though, I need to be busy down here. Telling the world about Jesus and living in a way that will please the Lord. And joyfully looking for the day when He comes to take me home. My wife and I were talking about this this morning. She said, do um, you think we're going to feel the rapture? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. The rapture like, ooh, you know, you're gone. Right? If you're looking up rapture, it's going to give you a different word in the dictionary. Just so you know, you did the wrong one. All right? Uh, tell me what rapture is real quick. Right? If you are going to experience a rapture, I cannot tell you what you're going to feel or not feel. All I know is I don't want to be yelling at somebody when it happens. I don't want to be going, Kenny, you dirty, rotten, low-down scoundrel, I can't stand this up. Hi, Lord. I do not want that to happen to me. And because of that, I should be careful about doing the right things and saying the right things all the time. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Do you have the right stuff? The foundation on the inside, faith, hope, and love. That's the right pattern. Are you on the right path? Do you have the right priorities in life? Do you have the right priorities in life? Because i got to tell you honestly, with some of us here, I kind of wonder if we have the right priorities. Because the right priorities in your life would put God first. And if God was first, some of the things you're dealing with now would be gone out of your life. If God was the number one priority in your life, you'd be a whole lot more of a charitable person than you are now. If God was the right priority in your life, I wouldn't see you every weekend or every other week. I would see you for every service. Every time the doors of the church were open, you'd be here if God was the right priority in your life. And I can't answer these questions for you. You have to answer them for yourself. But as the piano begins to play, you need to answer that question. Do you have the right pattern? Do you have the right priority? If God has spoken to you, won't you come? How's the Lord spoken to your heart this morning?
You need to be saved. I want to know about it. I want to share the word of God with you. You need to be baptized. I want to know about it.